Hello and welcome to WTF Stories and Advice. I'm Caroline Cranshaw. And I'm Daryl Gove. Ah! And we <laughs> are WTF Stories and Advice. Yes, we're the two therapists that give crazy ass advice and tell crazy stories. And we have got a couple of crazy stories for you today. Mm, yes, we do. A few stories. Do you want to go first, Daryl, with the letter we received? Yeah, yeah. I've got this one already for you, if you like. It's uh, a letter from a girl in USA, and it's juicy. So uh, I might just (laughs) jump right in, shall I? Okay, yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool. So, hi, Caroline and Daryl. My name's Sarah, and I've been listening to your podcast for about a year now. I love your content. I laugh out loud all the time. I thought you'd be interested in a story that happened to me in college. Well, Actually, it's a few stories all in one. It involves a super rich girl from Mexico City, the Mexican drug cartel, the heir to Ferrari, semen, drugs, and a robbery. So pretty much everything we like, right? (laughs) Yeah, you have my attention. (laughs) I swear to God that this story actually happened to me my first year of college in Santa Barbara, California. So I lived in Isla Vista next to UCSB, but I went to City College across town. A little backstory, though, first. I grew up in a pretty conservative environment where my parents' rules were incredibly strict. For example, my mother told me that if she ever finds out I had sex, she would take me out of school and make me volunteer at a church every day with only women. Oh, my God. Well, I bet she hoped that she didn't have sex with women. (laughs) I know, but she's gay. (laughs) It's like, oh, no, it's so hard. (laughs) Please don't do that, mummy. (laughs) Don't send me to the nunnery. (laughs) Oh yeah, I was 17. My parents were so constrictive that I never got to experience many things that normal teenagers got to, such as experimenting with alcohol, boys, and clothes. So you can imagine why I decided to move to the craziest party town in California. Hell yeah, Santa Barbara. Oh yeah, I went to quite a few parties there in <laughs> uni. Woohoo! Sounds like a fun place. So my mother was actually the one to find my roommate on Craigslist. And my roommate's name was Yvonne. After meeting her, we were signing a lease within 24 hours, which in hindsight was not a good idea. She was from Mexico City and was incredibly wealthy. She was from a Russian family and she had me convinced her parents were part of a Mexican drug cartel. Which they probably were. (laughs) Russian and Mexico City. Hello. Yes. (laughs) She sounds intriguing. Yeah. (laughs) So I got a job straight away at a pizza shop across the street from my apartment. My first day at work was on the first day that I actually moved to the city. And when I got home that first night, I showed up to my apartment and it was full of gorgeous shirtless men and my Mm -hmm. new roommate there in a bikini. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> sounds like my kind of party at uni yeah go on welcome to Santa Barbara <laughs> so what do I do I thought fuck it and threw on a bikini and immediately started partying nice the next day was the first day of school which was at the city college across town we had decided to carpool the day before and so Yvonne came in asking if I wanted breakfast that was a really nice feeling I really felt like I'd hit the lottery with this girl and she said that she felt the exact same thing So I went out my room into the living room, and what did I see? A massive pile of cocaine. (laughs) We do coke Uh for breakfast in this house. Nice. (laughs) I'm thinking how I thought at that age, yep. (laughs) Not how I think now. I don't do coke for breakfast now. A couple of days ago, my my partner was looking through some old uni photos from like 10 years ago, and every photo, there was heaps and heaps of coke everywhere. (laughs) <laughs> but that's because um, in Argentina, they drink Coca-Cola with their um, Fernet, this alcohol, this kind of liqueur spirit that everybody drinks. Yeah. And like nobody was drinking beer or wine. It was just Coke everywhere. That's what she so means, tr- right? Uh, no, that's not what she means, Daryl. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. <laughs> he, I mean, he is from South America, so I'm sure there was some other kind of Coke. <laughs> well, Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it. That's where it gets its name. Right, it was like got you cola and cocaine, but then they had to take it out, right? Yeah, well, co- no, cocaine leaves like coke. Yeah, was it not just coca? Yeah, 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 like real cocaine, not go to cola. Oh, that- no, oh, that was the cola part of the Coca Cola. 
I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I could be wrong, but. <laughs> Go on. Okay. Yeah. Cool. cool. So this is, this is getting juicy. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, my first time doing coke was on the morning of the first day of college, and it set off a whole new side to me. Well, I'd say it would. Yeah. In the car on the way to school, she offered me Adderall for my studies, and I immediately (laughs) fell in love with it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. That night, she fixed my insomnia with Xanax, and I fell head over heels for prescriptions. Oh, wow. She continued to feed me drugs throughout the year, and we would party. But I had a lot of social anxiety and was pretty shy. So she decided to fix me. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) The Xanax was in the Coke wasn't doing the job, huh? (laughs) Probably causing the anxiety, the withdrawal from the Xanax. Exactly. So she had a male friend who used to take random pictures of me and would talk to me constantly about being an escort. Oh, no. Another time, he told me how much money he could make if I got into porn. How much money he could make. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a good deal to me. <laughs> so you tell her she's going to make a million dollars. Exactly. Then. She should make a lot of money, but not him. Fuck him. It's her body. And she puts in brackets here, nothing wrong with sex workers if it's your choice. Exactly. He says, she continues, I think this guy was trying to condition me. Well, yes, it sounds like that. I heard a lot of, oh, well, you have so much potential. And I could see you doing X, Y, Z sex stuff in the future. Mm. Future pacing her. Yes. One time, Yvonne came home and told me about a really great way to do coke that took half the amount and lasted twice as long. <laughs> oh, no. I, can ju- I know. I know what she's going to say. Yep, go on. <laughs> that Woo-hoo. night, she had 15 girls in my living room. That's a lot of women to fit in one living room. Must have been a big place with their asses in the air, getting oh. coke blown up their asses. Who was who was blowing their coke up their ass? I don't know. Some lucky guy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did she do last night? Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, blew coke up 15 girls' asses. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Probably if, if whoever did it had coke blown up their ass, they would have been like, this is fine. I'm having a great time. Yeah. You just want them to suck it back out. <laughs> oh, this could take a dark turn. Let's see what happens. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no. So yes, I did participate and it was fun. They called themselves the Turtle Club. And- <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, please explain. Well, she's actually put in brackets. By the way, are you able to explain this? I know it's from something else, but I'm just not sure. So if any of our listeners know what the turtle club means or if there's anything to that. I don't, maybe if you poke it, I don't know. <laughs> I've got images of, of like heads coming back out of their asses now, like little turtle heads. Yeah. I just think if like, if you poke a turtle, how it like sucks in, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, they do. They like suck inside of themselves. So maybe that, Hmm, I don't know. But if you, yeah, I mean, I had a friend who had the nickname Turtle in uni. And it was <laughs> like, because if you put her on her back, she can't get off. Oh, no. <laughs> so they don't get back. Oh. So, I know. Fucking people are assholes. Yeah. And she wasn't. She was just, yeah, like to have fun. That's all. Oh, bless it. Fuckers. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, fucking bastards. Yeah. So moving on. One time. Yvonne got lice, and she totally blamed it all on me. I'm guessing pubic lice. Yeah. That's called crabs, sweetheart. Crabs, darling. Crabs. I had a flatmate do that to me, actually. She got terrible crabs, and this is when I was in uni in San Diego, and blamed me and our other roommate, or, you know, flatmate. And neither of us had, like, had sex for months, and we were both, like, totally waxed. So we're like, eh. We don't have any pubic hair, number one. And number two, we haven't been with anyone. But her boyfriend fucked everything that moved, right? So, yeah. yeah. He was like, oh, I think you got it from the toilet seat from your uh, your roommates. Fuck it, yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, he gave her so many STDs. It was funny. Sorry, side note. Anyways, go on. No, but that's a good point. I remember a lot of guys in, when I was in my early 20s, I lived with a whole bunch of different girls and their boyfriends Mm -hmm. and so on. And and there would be rumors like that flying around. Oh, you gave me crabs from a towel. It's like... 
look, your boyfriend's cheating on you. Just accept it. Don't make up some story about catching him from the toilet seat. Exactly. So, however, um, so her flatmate totally blamed her. I'm not sure how word got out that my flatmate had them. It could have been me. My bad. But But she called me dirty and gross and said it had to be me. So my mother drove four hours to stay with me and fix it. I mean, I would have went to the doctor or something or the chemist. But How did her mother fix it? Like sterilize everything? The first thing she did was check me. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Oh, poor girl. <laughs> and poor I, mom. Yeah, no, that's, that's not a, something. That's that, a good mom. That's a good mom. That is a good mom. I mean, I would prefer a GP to be taking a look, to be fair. But, <laughs> but... <laughs> However, <laughs> each to Aww. each to their own. That's very kind of kind of you, um, Sarah's mum. Yeah. And oh, wait, are you supposed to be saying the name? Oh, she put her name there. Oh, she did. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. She says, "Hi, I'm Sarah." Or should I make okay. it anonymous? I'll change it. Um, so, well, no, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not like you're going to say anything else. There's no surnames sure or nothing like that. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of Sarahs. Yeah. Cool. So, um, and apparently she didn't have any. So yeah. that's her mum looked real good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how she fixed it. Fixed it by discovering I don't have them. But apparently that's when things started to go south. So winter break happened. And when they came back, Yvonne was telling me about this amazing vacation she took where she met a very wealthy man. This man was Italian and went by the name Ant or Antonio. Well, he wasn't an American citizen and he needed citizenship for business reasons. Yvonne made this person seem like he was going to make me famous and rich for the rest of my life. So when I got the opportunity to meet him, I hopped in my car and drove to LA. So I met this guy and he couldn't prove any wealth. He was less than five foot. He just sounded oh. so much taller on the phone. So it was hard not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd never trust how tall someone sounds on the phone. <laughs> oh, you know, I was, I was playing um, Elder Scrolls yesterday and i was speaking there's there's this group i'm in for lgbt gamers Mm -hmm. and i was speaking to some guys and this guy could guess how tall you were by your voice really he was like so you must be short right i'm like yeah i'm like five seven he's like yeah i can tell because your voice is really compact like short guys have got compact voices and and so on he maybe he's a singer or something like that because he's always singing that's interesting, um, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I guess which is he sounded so much taller on the phone, maybe he didn't have a compact voice. Yeah. Do I sound short? Because I am short. I'm five two. So <laughs> but I don't think I would sound like I'm short. I'm you, gonna breathe right down into my lungs. I think I'm you sound tall. really tall. I think I sound tall too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, okay, we are digressing all over the place. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So he did. So he was really short and she laughed at him, which is pretty mean. But however, he did know a lot about lavish lifestyles. Well, it's easy to learn that watching Kardashians. Yeah. And he told me so many stories. But again, he could not prove anything. Mm-hmm. We went to Laguna Beach, which is a very rich area. There was a Ferrari driving by. And without even turning his head, he said, that Ferrari is broken. So I was slightly convinced. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone could say that. Right? Anybody could say that. Remember, at the time, I was an 18-year-old girl. So I would just about believe anything. Yeah, I'm quite sheltered as well. So Yeah. So he ended up offering me 20000 a year if I marry him, which is not actually that much. And then he said that he will have connections for me for a lifetime, whatever that means. Hmm. Even if he was legit, I had this boyfriend I really liked at the time. So why did you go and meet him then? <laughs> <laughs> Just in case he was hot yeah. and tall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gotta check these things out. And if it's not a better offer, then maybe not. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, Keep yeah. options open. So anyways, I got a lot of anxiety from this guy and it was mm. just not my speed. I wasn't raised in a lavish lifestyle, so I would get really insecure around those things. I ended up completely ghosting him. And Yvonne freaked the fuck out. From then on, she would call me fat and say incredibly mean things to me. She Mm. went around telling everybody that I had STDs. And on multiple occasions, she took my clothes from the closet and walked them right out to the dumpster outside. Oh my God. Wow. Bitch. bitch. There were other times when she was completely nice to my face too, 
which gave me so much anxiety, I developed IBS, that's irritable mm. bowel syndrome, and started shitting my pants. Aww. Which I think is hilarious looking back at. Well, I I don't think that's funny, darling. Oh, oh you poor thing. Poor. IBS is so caused by stress. And the most effective treatment for IBS is hypnotherapy. A hundred percent. hundred percent. And don't eat dairy. Don't eat okay. dairy and do hypnotherapy. Wow. I had plenty of clients who had terrible IBS to the point where they had multiple, multiple surgeries. And yeah, I would do like muscle testing or kinesiology. And I'd be like, oh, I don't, you know, cut out dairy. And they're like, what do you mean? The doctor tells me to have it every meal to coat my stomach. <sighs> Stop dairy, went away completely. Crazy, eh? Now yeah. dairy is not good for IBS in my experience. No. No. So before things went south, she used to talk about buying someone's semen and baking huh? cookies out of it. Oh, Ew. I actually heard her on the phone with her friend Shane talking about how much she would pay him. You don't need to buy semen, sweetheart. It's free. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I have never had to pay for semen. Like, <laughs> that's crazy. I mean, maybe Anyways. Yvonne didn't have the, the charm to get free semen. <laughs> Pretty much any woman. <laughs> can get free semen. I would guarantee it. It doesn't matter what weight you are, how you look, you can get free semen. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> so anyway, she was obsessed with her weight and would never even think to eat cookies. But what do I come home to one day? Fresh baked chocolate chip cookies by her. Don't touch it. Did she really think I was that fucking dumb? <laughs> Obviously so, not. Good. Well, she I, thought she was that dumb, but yeah. <laughs> I would have like pretended to eat them and then watch her laughing. Could, like put like half of a cookie on the table. And then put it in her food. <laughs> yeah, crumble it up. That's a good idea. So yeah. I need to stress how much of a psycho bitch she was. <laughs> oh, you, yeah, you're, I'm already convinced. But anyways, yeah, go on. She stayed friends with everyone, especially the ones she didn't like, specifically to fuck with them. And do fucked up shit like feed them cookies with semen baked into them. Hmm. So eventually, I started only to sleep at my house. I thought you lived with her, but I will go to school and work. And other than that, I would sit in my car or hang out with my boyfriend and his friends. Oh, and so she'd only sleep there. She'd only sleep there. Ah, that's it. Go home just to yeah. sleep. And the only friends that I made were Yvonne's friends. So one day, she started calling me over and over and over. So I finally answered and she said someone had robbed her. I showed up to my house and nothing of mine was stolen, but her room was completely thrashed and she said she was missing $5,000 in cash and drugs mm -hmm. and it had been while she was out of town. I was the only one in town at the time, so yeah, of course, I get called in and questioned by the police. Mm -hmm. They came in my room and searched me. They even got access to my bank statements. Wow. But I knew Yvonne by now. I knew her games. I knew how psychotic she was. This was all fake. I knew it was. Even her crying was fake. But I also knew that she was dangerous. And I was too pussy to tell them, the police, everything about her. I just didn't want daddy to come in and gift me a Colombian necktie. What's that? Mm. Oh, oh, that's where they cut your throat and they pull your tongue out your throat. What? Yeah, yeah. That Colombian thing? necktie. Yeah. It's normally for talking. Yeah. So yeah, if she talked, Yeah. Oh. You know, this is like, you know how we're talking how we find it kind of weird that in New Zealand, where we both live, but we're both immigrants here, how they'll just dob everyone in? Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Like people like really like telling on each other like over here. Or, yeah. I had a client yesterday who is, works with the police and he's like, you wouldn't believe how many phone calls we're getting with people dobbing each other in. But like in America, you know, the, the culture is snitches get stitches. You don't fucking tell on people unless it's serious. Right. And you yeah. have the same thing in Scotland, right? Yeah. We, 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 we say, don't, don't be a grass. Don't be a clipe is the word yeah. for a snitch. Don't be a clipe. Yeah, we don't but do it's, it. it's, it's so yeah, the American culture, South American culture is you don't fucking tell on people unless it's like life or death or, you know, they're harming children and stuff like that. Then you do. But otherwise, you just keep your goddamn mouth shut or else, yeah, you're going to end up in a ditch somewhere or with a Colombian necktie. Shit, a brick. Yeah. Mm. Okay, this is okay. I, I read this letter. And I'm like, I imagined it was like getting hung or something, but this is much more creative. <laughs> yeah. So... She told the cops everything about my drug use and some other things that I won't go too detailed into. Even though they were the drugs that she was feeding me, she still told them. 
And after almost getting arrested, I moved out of Isla Vista and moved over closer to the school across town. That's a good move. Probably should have done it earlier. Very good move. Yeah. And even if it was real, the robbery, I bet there were a bunch of people that aren't me that would gladly rob her because she was a fucking bitch. Mm. After a few weeks, the cops stopped calling me and I think I was in the clear. Well, if by the time you've written this letter, they haven't got back in touch, probably. (laughs) But it doesn't end there. She told me stories of her hiring private investigators to watch people before. She told me so many horror stories of awful things she had done to people. I was still watching my back. Everywhere I would walk or drive, I was aware of my surroundings. I finally got this feeling of being followed. I wasn't sure, but I thought she'd hired a private investigator to follow me. I'd be walking home and see a parked car with someone just sitting in the car, although the windows were too dark to see what the person really looked like. But it was the same black car I kept noticing. When I would go to school, when I'd go to work, it would always be there. Then one day, it was a few months into the fall semester, I was riding my bike to school. I remember I was going fast, like as fast as I could on this bike. And out of nowhere, something flew into the front spokes of my tires, stopped my bike dead in its tracks, and I went flying and face-planted into the concrete. Oh. Ooh. I was like standing up on the bike, really pumping fast. Ended up breaking teeth. I was covered in road rash. And I got post-traumatic stress after, as a result of that as well. I bet. Concrete is super hard. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Poor girl. Uh, Well, to be fair, I've done that cycling downhill, but that's another story. This could be a stretch, but I think Yvonne had something to do with that. I think she paid someone to throw something into my tire. I was on the side street of a bunch of cars lined up, parked on the side of the road. There would have been so much opportunity to hide between the cars and throw something out. And if she really was who she said she was, then it makes sense. Mm. But those feelings of being followed stopped immediately after that. And I never saw that black car again. After recovering from my accident, I felt like it was a pivotal moment to put that all behind me. Shit, a brick. Well, if the black car stopped following her, it sounds like he was looking for an opportunity to harm her. But that doesn't sound like a private investigator. No, that's more like a hired thug. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, when you get that feeling that you're being followed, listen to it. Unless you are a paranoid schizophrenic, and then maybe not. (laughs) Maybe talk to some other people and see if they agree. Or if they look at you like like you're crazy, then you might be. Not not crazy, but, you know, having kind of some delusions. The mind's a powerful thing. But, yeah, I think our intuition keeps us safe. And, yeah, I mean, that to me sounds like she's probably dead on of exactly what happened. I'd say so. I, it's one of those situations where someone says, this is what I'm like, this is what I do. And then you get a feeling of being followed, which would be your unconscious picking up things that you're not consciously aware of, Mm. like patterns or like your unconscious may have seen that car three or four days before you noticed it consciously. Or that energy, that energy of something like when you're driving in the car and you look over and the person's staring at you or you know what I mean? It's just like you can feel it when people are watching you. Yeah. You know, you definitely can. It's like how you always know there's a ghost in the house, but that's a story Mm. for another day. (laughs) So after recovering from the accident, I felt like it was a moment that I had to move on with my life and put all of that behind me. So I got some counselling and I'm now drug free. Yay, well done. Good for her. I'm living my best life with a boyfriend who adores me. Although I still think about Yvonne. I still feel anger and resentment about it. But I also feel like, as silly as it sounds, we could have been good friends. Sometimes I miss her. Any thoughts on people who miss toxic people? Anyway, thanks for reading all this. I really hope to hear back from you oh that's so sweet i mean it's natural because the relationship you were in with her was an abusive relationship right yeah and it's quite normal for that connection between the perpetrator and the victim to continue after the relationship ends so you you're she's not thinking about you she's not thinking about you at all but you're you're maybe missing her you're angry with her you've got this mixed emotions because you know part of you loved her you were you're you wanted to be great friends with her. You thought you'd hit the jackpot. And when she turned out not to be who you thought she was, you were still in love with that image of who you first met. Mm-hmm. And I think it's time to kind of, you know, if you if you still feel anger and resentment, I think you have to express that in some way. Probably not to her because she's not going to care. <laughs> <laughs> well, that she might do something else to you. <laughs> but, um, you know, write it down, write a book, write, write a poem, write a song, go 
to another therapist and tell them that you've got this anger and resentment left over that you need to express. It'd put her photo on a dartboard and throw darts at it. I don't know. <laughs> and um, realize that if you, you miss her, you don't miss her. You miss what you thought she was and you miss the feeling of being on drugs probably when you're mm-hmm. with her. I'd, I'd really... And the, <laughs> and the feeling of moving to a new city and, and, you know, and having a new life and new friends and partying. If, if you miss parts of her, you'll find that in other people. Yeah, I think... I've had similar things where I had friends that were incredibly toxic and eventually because things got so bad, I would end the friendship, but I did still miss them. And I think it's, people aren't always a hundred percent bad. You know, they have their good traits. You have great times together and it's okay to miss those things, but it's also, it's important to make sure you end, end the relationship, which she totally has done. A really good book is uh, Radical Forgiveness by Colin tippings and it's got these like worksheets that you can do with it you can actually like download these worksheets and it really gets you to kind of look at you know you write down i'm angry with so and so because they did you know this to me and then it's like i felt like this before when blah blah blah. and it gets you to kind of look Mm -hmm. back and see where else you have wounds and how you might be projecting onto this person and trying to kind of heal a wound from before Sounds awesome. So, yeah. But I think, I mean, another thing you can do is like do a little visualization where you close your eyes and you take some deep breaths and you imagine a cord going from her to you and you cut that cord and you imagine her floating off in the distance and you can imagine like taking back any energy you've ever gave her from that relationship of that just kind of coming back to you that you have like a magnet inside of you that's going to draw that all back. Because I think, yeah, we can give and we can give and we still have these energetic ties to people. So it's a good metaphor for the subconscious just to cut that. You can imagine a white light washing over you and that's like releasing their energy and any trauma they've hurt you. If you find you continue to think about someone, even though you don't want to, I find a good little technique is to just imagine someone who grosses you the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Like someone so nasty, so disgusting that you're just like, "Eh," and you superimpose their face over it. Or you just like exaggerate the really bad traits about them and you just make them (laughs) horrific. (laughs) And yeah, and then your brain goes, eh, I don't, don't want to think about them anymore. You know, because we all have people in our life that were just uh, awful or, you know, moving on. You're like, you don't think about certain people. Your brain just goes, ew, yuck, no, no. And un- yeah, what I would say is unclean, unclean. <laughs> you know, you think <laughs> about some people that you're like, oh God, what the fuck was I thinking? And yeah, you can just like make them really just dis- disgusting in your mind. And then it's like, you don't want to think about them, cut that cord, watch them fly away or, you know, off in the distance and you can just release them. So that's my advice. I think that's good advice. And I, I think no matter what you do, no matter how much you miss her, please do not get back in touch. Just stay awake. As you say, you've already put in a past, you've done your counseling, you're drug free, you've got a great boyfriend who adores you and you still think of her like... Caroline says it's natural, normal to miss the parts of her that were good, but let her go. Uh, A really amazing Christian therapist once told me to unforgive someone. Mm. So I I was working through some stuff and she says, no, 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 let me explain forgiveness to you. It's not something you just do. It's not something you can just say, I forgive you and think it and it's happened. So I want you to unforgive this person. And now we're going to work through the process of forgiveness. Mm. And it was a very interesting concept. And I, I felt so liberated to be able to unforgive this person for what they'd done. It was such an amazing feeling to go, do you know what? I don't fucking forgive you. I'm <laughs> angry with you. You're a bad person. You should be in jail. And it, it, it just was so good. So, you know, if you've, pre- and this to any listener, if you've prematurely forgiven somebody that's hurt you without actually expressing your anger or how you felt about it, then maybe you haven't done the process right. And that could be why something might linger and it doesn't completely let go of. So for me, after unforgiving this person, I went through a process of releasing my emotions, my feelings around the matter. And then at the end, decided to leave him unforgiven. Mm. So, and in my mind, the way I I don't think about him, I don't think about the guy or what he did or anything like that. All I think about is him being in a jail cell. In my mind, that's where he is. And we just left him there on a picture on the wall in her house. And that's where he goes. And forgiveness isn't necessary for me in this because the only forgiveness that I really needed in that situation was for myself. Exactly. 
when I was forgiving him, I wasn't able to forgive myself, but by for unforgiving him, I could then forgive myself. And it was really freeing. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, just something to think about. Maybe that, that forgiveness is a process and start by expressing the, your real feelings about the situation, which you've done really well in this letter, actually. Yeah. So thank you. That's, that's such a cool concept because yeah, I, I mean, I talk to people about forgiveness all the time and they always go, well, I don't want to forgive them. And I'm like, okay, it's not about, you don't really have to forgive them, but what it is, is it's about letting it go yourself and healing the trauma that it's caused. It's it, forgiveness to me, and maybe it always needs to be changed into a new word or there needs to be like another way to, to frame it because yeah, like I think you just, some people have done stuff that you just could never condone. You never, I would never say to people, that's okay that you did that. I forgive you. Like I haven't forgiven a lot of fucking <laughs> people for shit and don't want to. But what I have done is, yeah, I guess in a way it is forgiving yourself for getting into that situation or, you know, allowing that to happen, whatever way that may be. And yeah, it's really about healing it within your own self. So it's not something that festers away and causes you pain and issues. And I think a lot of health issues, a lot of trauma, you know, anxiety, post-traumatic stress is hanging on to that pain in some way. But I think anger is so important and it's okay to be angry. A hundred percent. I mean, a lot of us are taught, don't be angry, don't feel anger. Anger is a bad emotion, but it's such a fucking important emotion when it comes to protecting you and keeping danger away from you. When people have this feeling of, I need to forgive someone, it's usually because they're thinking a negative feeling, that they've got a negative emotion or thought around the person. And I think you're right, what they they actually want or need isn't necessarily a, a forgiveness, but a release of that emotion in whatever way that comes, because some shit is unforgivable. It is. And people say, oh, I forgive them two days after they drunk drove and killed my son in a car crash. Well, I'm like, that's really big. And I'm so like, that's amazing that your heart is so big that you want to do that. I think at the same time later, you're probably going to want to come and revisit some really strong feelings that you've got inside of you because forgiveness isn't an action. It's a process. That's the lesson that I took from it. And it's whatever process lets go of that feeling from within you so that you're no longer thinking bad thoughts about that person. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're forgiven. It means you're not thinking any negativity because that if you're thinking negative thoughts, that's in your head. That's your feelings. It's not affecting them. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, the the cycle of grief and forgiveness and all that, it's not linear, you know, like they talk about these stages of grief. And I think those are completely linked with forgiveness because I think it's, it's all related to trauma. Yeah. But, you, you know, you can be you know, in denial and then in shock and all these different things. And you can just keep changing it up. You know what I mean? People are like, oh, I thought I was already over that. I thought I was in acceptance. And now I'm back into denial and I'm angry and I'm, you know, we're there. Yeah. So I think it's that it's, there's just layers to it and it's, it's a process. So, oh, well, interesting letter. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. All right. Well, I've got a letter too. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Hello. I am obsessed with this podcast so much so I've re-listened to it three times already. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Thank you. So this isn't a super crazy story, but I thought you'd you'd give me your advice in this situation. So this is about an ex-coworker of mine. He was 20 at the time and I was 22. Backstory on him. He was in a relationship and around June or July of 2019, he messaged me and told me he was going to propose to his girlfriend. I thought he was fucking insane, but he's because he's only 20, but to each their own. So I sent my positive vibes to him. After three months, he messaged me and said he was engaged. And even though I thought it was a crazy idea, I still sent him my congratulations. We didn't talk for a couple of months until December 2019 came. And this is when shit got weird. So this past December, he messaged me and I didn't think much of it because we're friends. So after a few messages, he randomly told me that he and his fiance hadn't had sex in a while. And it caught me off guard because we never talked about things like this. Well, I tried giving him advice on how to plan around his and her work schedules. He then told me he was planning on finding someone to meet his needs. Basically, yeah, basically (laughs) cheating on his fiance to let out his sexual frustration. With the, I haven't had sex in a while and I don't normally talk about that. Isn't that a line that guys use a lot of the time? Oh, Oh, we don't sleep together anymore or my wife doesn't touch me. And sometimes it could be the truth, of course. 
jackpot. I had a client once tell me how he was having an affair and he was like, oh, my wife and I, we like never have sex. And I was like, well, how often do you have sex? And he's like, only like five times a week. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) oh, you poor fucking thing. Only five times a week. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Yeah. I was like, that is the worst excuse I've ever fucking heard. Try again. (laughs) (laughs) So... All right. So basically cheating on his fiance to let out a sexual frustration. I'm against cheating. So I found it weird that he'd, he'd confess this to me. After an hour, he decided to ask me if I'd have sex with him. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately said no, because I wouldn't want to be the other woman. He continued to ask and my answer was always no. Good girl. So this is where I fucked up. Every time I was drunk, we'd text and I would flirt back with him and I gave him the idea that I was down to have sex with him. No, 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 no. Not a good idea. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, she's like 22, right? You know, that's, yeah, that's the shit you do when you're 22 and yeah, you might be drunk and you're like, Haha. this happened so many times that one day I just told him, I've been drunk every time we flirt, so don't get your hopes up. In January, he asked again if I'd have sex with him and I said no. We didn't talk for a month or so, and then around March, he messaged me again. It got to the point where every time we'd text, the issue of his sexual frustration would come up, and I was so fucking over it. It's kind of persistent and needy sounding. Yeah, it's like, dude, yeah. Take the Either message. She said no. Sort it out with your fiance, or, yeah, or, and if you're not willing to, I mean, that's not a good sign. If you're like 20, 21 years old. And you're not having sex, there's something going on there, right? Mm -hmm. Because you should be fucking like rabbits at that age. This is the line I never thought he'd cross. Around April this year, he ended up telling me that he's thinking about asking his cousin to have sex with him. Okay, it's taking a turn. I lost my shit when he told me this. I didn't even know what to say because I think incest is obviously not okay. (laughs) Same, thank you. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Also, like, asking your cousin, like, oh, by the way, um, yeah, b- before we um, go to Auntie jo- Jody's house, can you give me a quick X, Y, Z? Oh, he asked me for advice on how to ask his cousin, and I kept thinking, what the fuck is wrong with you? And how desperate can someone be to have to ask a family member? I didn't know what to say, so I gave some weird answers. Every time this conversation would come up, I wonder what her weird answers were. I want to hear them. I want to hear them. Why, why, don't, why don't you put on like a toupee and like ring her and put on Mickey Mouse voice? Would you like to have sex with me? <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Every time this conversation would come up, I'd bite my tongue. And then recently I asked him, don't you think it's weird to have an incestuous relationship? And he said he didn't mind it because he didn't love her romantically. <laughs> Because he loves her in a friendship way or like as a family way. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. I don't even know what to say to him. What are your thoughts? Oh. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, like the, here's the thing. Porn is now normalizing incest. Like yep. if you, I think, and we've discussed this before in the podcast, haven't we? We did. Yep. If you go to Pornhub or any of those sites and you look at the front page I shit you not, 80% of those flat front page are incestuous relationships. Stepdad, stepmom, cousin, stepsister. Like it is, yeah. And I guess what they're, they're doing it in a way that it's, so it's not like brother and sister are having sex or, you know what I mean? It's like making it step parenting things. But what the fuck is going on that that is now the trending porn like i should i should look up right now and just see what it says remember the last time that we had a conversation like this and you're like i'm just gonna look that up and then your partner came in the room (laughs) (laughs) what's that on your screen it's research (laughs) that's right what were we looking at i don't remember (laughs) it was something you're like it'd be funny if you walked in (laughs) okay well this is oh here we go so, uh, so far I see one cop se- stepsister masturbating and she blows me cheating stepmom and aunt share big dick. It's on the front page. This is the front page. Okay. Most viewed videos in New Zealand. We're in New Zealand. Number one, stepsister seduces me, had to fuck her well. Here's number wow. four, fucking my stepmom in the ass while she's <sighs> stuck in, while she's stuck to the couch. Stuck to the couch. 
Yeah, bit bratty sis boned then blackmailed my big stepsister. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like an on and on and on. It is so, <laughs> I don't even want to say some days. That's enough. I have to just go ahead and say the one that you don't want to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do it, do it, do it. 1,000 facials, teen blow banged by stepbrothers bullies. Okay, maybe you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you asked. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay so what the fuck why did i say learn what's her name uh i didn't say her name because she she didn't say it in the thing and all there is the email so so i've got thoughts about what you're saying so you're asking him what to do right there, there seems like there's two questions here one is like what do we do about him wanting to bang his cousin well it sounds to me like he's not going to ask his cousin for sex it sounds to me like he's wanting to talk to you about sex. You're not wanting to have sex with him. And so he's saying, well, I'm going to go have sex with my cousin. How should I ask her? That's not a normal conversation you have with a workmate, you know? Yeah. I don't think he's going to ask his cousin for sex. And even if he does, then he's just super creepy for talking to you about it and super creepy for doing that. So my advice would be to distance yourself from him because as you said, you're not into cheating. You don't want to be the other woman. Whatever the problems he has in his relationship, he needs to fix them or leave before he starts looking for sex somewhere else. Unless of course they're open, which is a different situation, but that doesn't sound like it's the case. It sounds to me also like maybe you are interested in him a little bit because otherwise, why didn't you just completely shut this down? Mm. You know, are do you like him? Are you waiting for him to split up? I will be having an open and honest conversation around the lines of, look, you've got a girlfriend. While you've got a girlfriend, I will not speak to you about sex and make a decision yourself that you're not going to do that again. If you do, then conversation will end there for good. I, w- I would create a line that I would not be willing to go past. That That's my advice for you. And if he says, okay, dump my girlfriend, I like you, I love you, and you feel the same, then... Ask no, again. Ask no. Again. <laughs> Caroline says no to that. <laughs> I'd say no as well. But, but I guess my point is, you said you don't want to be the other woman, but it sounds like you're interested. So talk to us again if that happens before you make any decisions. I have a rule in life that if there's decisions like that to be made, I give Caroline permission to make decisions for me. And I think you should do the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, Daryl does call me up and goes, what do I do? I'm like, this is what you're going to do. And I just tell him. And it works. Um. Yeah, here's what I would say. I would say, oh my God, that reminds me of that movie where this, you know, young couple got engaged and they stopped having sex. And then the guy was like trying to hit up his workmates. And then he was like totally obsessing about fucking his cousin. So he's always asking like the other women who he had hit on about fucking his cousin. Like, have you seen that movie? And the guy would be like, uh, no, I haven't seen that. And you go, that's right. Because no one would fucking watch that movie because that's gross. Like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> there, this, this is good I think we've, you've given that advice before Caroline and it's great advice for anybody in a shady relationship Yeah, like you do that whole movie metaphor if it's not a good movie then the answer is no I, I, yeah. just, I just want to know why you've taken some back I know, I know that you said she's 22 and she's young Caroline but for me I think there has to be more to it Like, I don't think age is enough of a reason I mean she's probably enjoying the attention Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when someone likes you or is kind of trying to proposition you or talk to you about this stuff, it's kind of like they shine a light on you. Even if you're not really that interested, it's still nice to get attention. But what you need to realize is that that light is inside of you and you can shine it anytime you want. You shouldn't. And we all do. It's that it's needing outside affirmation, right? To make yourself feel good. But I think, yeah, she, please, 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 don't ever fuck this guy, even if he's single. Like, that's just, he's got some fucking issues. It's almost like he's trying to shock you a bit. And also, maybe he's thinking that you're going to try to save his cousin <laughs> from being propositioned if you have sex with him. You know what I mean? It sounds like really manipulative to me. Yeah. But I do think that uh, with the trend in porn, that people are, it's somehow incest is being normalized, which is fucking terrifying. I mean, that is illegal. It is illegal to have, well, I don't know if it's illegal to have sex with your cousin, is it? It's certainly illegal to have sex with your step parents or siblings. That is actually against the law. Yes, that's correct. It's against the law. I think it varies from country to country. 
about like how far into your family the legality stems, but I, d- I don't know the details. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would look up wherever you live and see what the actual law is. Some like states in America and I think the UK actually permit cousins marrying and having children, which to me is just what in the actual fuck can you not find (laughs) someone that's not? Yeah, like, I'm sorry, it's your DNA should be very different to the person that you have a child with. You know what I mean? Because the closer your DNA is, the more genetically weak a child is. And yep. actually, like if you're related to someone, they should smell a bit off to you. Like the, the closer your DNA is to that person, the more their smell is a bit off-putting normally. Um, and the more diverse, the more attracted you are to them. So mm. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And so, I don't know, maybe people, some people don't have that in their brain, but. Is that why opposites attract then? Because you got such different genes and you're like. Mm, you smell great. Yeah. The pheromones. Yeah. Well, I think it is. But it. But what's interesting now is like, I know that's definitely true for women. I'm not sure about men if they have the same way of sensing pheromones. I think they do in a way that women are ovulating and stuff like that. But so a woman that is not on birth control picks a man that is very genetically dissimilar. But the second she's on birth control or she's pregnant, she uh-huh. picks a man that's genetically similar. Her like taste, her smell that tells her changes. And the reason why they think this is, is that like to have a baby, right? You want to have someone very genetically diverse, right? So you're going to have a much stronger, healthier, smarter child. But once you're pregnant, you should pick someone who's genetically similar because they might be family and they're going to help you stick around and look after the child. So that's kind of how science has explained that. So if you're on the pill... Stay the fuck away from your fucking cousins or anyone related to you. Because they feel they, like yeah. they're pregnant. Because <laughs> your body might tell you a different story that it's safe for you to be around this person in maybe an intimate way because you need someone to look after your baby. Because when you're on the pill, your body thinks it's pregnant. So yeah, like I really don't believe you should choose a man that you have chosen if you're on the pill. Like most of the time it works out fine, but just, yeah, it might be an interesting experiment to go off the pill for a month and st- see if you still like the smell of them. Cause you might not. Oh gosh, that's given me a lot to think about. You mm. know, when I met my boyfriend, I, I showed my aunt a photo mm-hmm. and she looked at the photo and she goes, we look quite different. Like he's tall, dark and handsome, you know, brown eyes, like Argentinian guy. And I'm yeah, like the blonde, like blonde hair, blue eyed, yeah, blue eyes, and handsome as well. Scottish guy, but she saw a similarity in the face structure, and mm. she was like, "Okay, so your your jaw, your your nose, cheekbones, that structure is similar. You guys are going to make it." She's like, "I always can tell if a couple is going to make it because they've got a similar bone structure in the face." And That's interesting. My friend who does face reading does says the same thing that there has to be like some similarities, and yeah. I don't know. And it it kind of makes sense in, in two ways. One is, okay, you want the genetic diversity, but you also want the child, you know, the children should look good, ideally. You know, if you were to obviously be my boyfriend, you're going to find that tough. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God knows we've been trying, but um, <laughs> our insides must be wrong. But when yeah. you, um, you know, part of survival and evolution is symmetry. And so if the children are symmetrical, then they're going to look good and healthy and then they're going to find a mate and reproduce and so on so having some similarities is is possibly a good thing um and the other thing was what you said about the the anima or the animus last week in the call when we're talking about if you're a straight male who would you want to be as a woman what would you look like as a woman and you can be attracted to that and you know what the same christian counselor i saw years ago told me is that gay men are attracted to who they wish they looked like yeah, totally. Yeah, and um, so I guess that's their, you know, their male anim- animus. Or and I was like, yeah, you know, if if I was to think about when I was younger, at least. I mean, right now I'm really happy with who I am and how I look, and I, you know, I'm I like me. But I was thinking, yeah, that would have been my my animus. So, mm. but we do look different. So we'll we'll keep trying to have kids, and like if if we manage to get pregnant, then it'll be. <laughs> A fucking miracle. A miracle the first time. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll let you know. No, but what, you know, what you could do is you could take one's sperm and um, get your sister to donate an egg. And then you could have a baby that had both your DNA. Yeah, that's, that, 
that's something to think about. I mean, egg donation is a, is a big deal. My friend in England, she's going through the process right now of donating her eggs. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty massive ordeal. First, she got declined because she had depression. Mm-hmm. So she is like a really healthy girl, beautiful. She was a model. You know, she's intelligent. She's got a really good job. She's such the kindest person that you've ever met. Really, really cool girl. And and out of the kindness of her own heart, she's like, I don't want children. I'm going to donate some eggs so that people who cannot have children can have some. Nice. And but they they declined her because of suffering some depression. I mean, come on, you know. Who hasn't? <laughs> it's like who hasn't suffered <laughs> depression? And and like these are like prime real estate of egg donation. Like if you if you're looking for an egg donor, that is the one you want. Trust me. Yeah, like that totally. is the egg that you want. And then of course you know you, you're not allowed. I think in the UK there's laws against like paying people for surrogacy or for eggs and things like mm. that. So all that she'll get is like a a small kind of retainer for being off work and I think it's like a really small amount it doesn't match what her pay would be so she's yeah. actually losing money being off work for six weeks or whatever so this is this is looking at happening this year I, obviously the whole process has been delayed with what's going on at the moment but yeah it's, it's pretty decent size surgery to go in in there and get the eggs out and do whatever they need to do so you know amazing honor for doing that I, I just think she's such a beautiful person and, and that's the kind of you know there's an egg there probably, but then you still need an oven. And I don't like thinking of women as ovens. I don't think that I could put a, a um, embryo into another human and expect them to carry that for me without falling in love with it and wanting to keep it. Well, you I, know, in New Zealand, like, yeah, a friend of mine had a surrogate and it was her egg, her husband's sperm. They, her best friend was surrogate and her best friend's a fucking saint. Mm-hmm. But in New Zealand, the baby is technically the surrogate's child, even after it's born, and they have to adopt the baby. It's the most ridiculous laws. And they had to have like the authorities come in and inspect their house and go through basically a full on adoption process to wow. adopt their genetic child. Yeah, it was just fucking nuts. And it, I mean, it all worked out perfectly. But what if you had a surrogate that was, you know, changed their mind and was like, no, I'm keeping it. You actually in New Zealand, you don't have any rights. Well, do you remember, um, I don't know if you watch Friends, the TV show, mm-hmm. yeah. and there's an episode where Phoebe Buffet surrogate yeah. for her brother Yeah, when she had triplets. And there was one stage during this process where she's confiding in, I think it was Rachel, and she goes, can I tell you a secret? <laughs> do you know what? I want to keep one. I want to keep one. <laughs> I, yeah, just, I remember that. Oh my God. And do you know, that was the moment, that exact moment that I thought, I cannot do that. I cannot mm. do it because how heartbreaking it was for for Phoebe to carry a child, three children in this circumstance that she doesn't get to keep, that she's fallen in love with, that she, her body is attached to, her soul is attached to, even if it doesn't belong to her genetically. It's a tough situation. But the thing is, like I know women who who have had donor eggs and, you know, then had the baby themselves. And when you think about it, their bodies make that baby, that baby, it may have a blueprint, but they actually provide all the materials that actually make that child. Right. So I think in a way they are a little bit there, you know what I mean? There is like, I think anyone who has a donor egg who has that baby themselves and, and, you know, is the, then the mother of that child, you made that child. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you just had someone give you the plans for it, but yeah. your body still made it. So I think it's like, it's still, it still is their child as well. So it's a, it's a fucking gray area. But I think if you agree to be a surrogate, you got to give that child to the fucking parents, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. If you agree, you got to be sure. So, okay, let's talk about some books because I got about 10 minutes left and then I've got to go. It's my daughter's 18th birthday today. I Yay. have a- Holy shit, how the fuck do I have an 18-year-old child? I just, uh, I'm way too young. <laughs> you do look too young. <laughs> in my mind, in my mind. Do you want to go first or? Um, yeah, okay. So I've, I've been, list- so now that we're uh, allowed to drive places again, Yay. I've started listening to audiobooks, which is my favorite way to consume books. Mm-hmm. And the book that I'm listening to at the moment is by Joe Navarro. Mm-hmm. And he was uh, an FBI trainer. He trained people in the FBI how to read body language. His book is called What Everybody Is Saying. Now, I like this book as compared to other books that I've read on body language and nonverbal communication. A, because of the tone, it's like it's it's really accessible, approachable, and it's it's got lots of stories about 
how he would solve cases by watching the body language of criminals, like how he caught a rapist by noticing that when he said left, his hand pointed to the right, or how mm. when some he went through a list of potential murder weapons and how the guy closed his eyes while the one that was used to kill the victim was said, and all these different ways that he spots tells. So it's a really fun and interesting way to learn nonverbal communication. And it starts with him talking about moving, I think, from Cuba to the USA when he didn't speak any English. He was a kid. And so to get on at school, he had to learn body language. He had to learn nonverbal communication because he oh, didn't have yeah. any English. And he realized one of the first lessons that he, he had was people who liked me raised their eyebrows when they walked in the room. And mm -hmm. the eyebrow flash. Eyebrow yep. flash. And the people that didn't like me would squint their eyes a bit when they walked in the room. Mm. And based off of that, I was telling Caroline earlier, I was, I've been watching Netflix and as soon as someone walks in the room, I'm like, they don't like the person. They like them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's great. And so anyway, he, he goes on and he tells more and more stories about catching criminals, working with terrorists, and also goes through step-by-step -step instructions and commandments of how to read body language. Because it's not as simple as arms crossed means you're um, holding something back. It could mean that you're cold. So he talks about establishing baselines with people and noticing deviations from the baseline. Oh, uh, yeah. And he talks about, at the same time, universal stuff. Like stuff that it doesn't matter what your culture is, doesn't matter where you're from, this is what this just means. And it's all backed up with brain scans and, and evidence and things like that. And then he even comes from another angle, which is really interesting, is look, even if you're not good at reading body language yet, because it's a skill that you can learn, you can notice if someone is comfortable or uncomfortable. Mm. Don't try to decipher any further than that. Just split it into comfort or discomfort, which one? If there's discomfort, then you know that that person is holding something back. And you don't need to necessarily know what that is, but that's some good information for you. If you're in a negotiation with business, if you're talking to a friend or your partner, if you're in a difficult situation, Comfort versus discomfort gives you a lot of information. So start there. So yeah, I recommend this book, Joe Navarro, what everybody is saying. It's going to help you improve your communication with other people. But more importantly, this information is going to keep you safe because when you can Absolutely. read other people, you can sense the threats and mm. stay away from them. What? Yeah, I've read that book actually years ago. It is a fucking fantastic book. Absolutely loved it. And yeah, I think, I mean, so much of communication is nonverbal and like just what people's mouths are saying, you know, the voices is not necessarily what's actually going on. So the more tools you can have to kind of read people, the better helps with communication in all ways. Yeah, that's a fantastic book. That's interesting because my book is, is there anything else you want to say about that before I start ranting about no, myself? No, there isn't it set for, I know that I know the name Joe Navarro from somewhere and I cannot think where it is. Football player. Is he? Well, no, Joe Navarro. Um, there's Dave Navarro, who's uh, hot, Red Hot Chili Peppers. No. Um, I thought there was a Joe Navarro that was a football player, but maybe I'm thinking of Joe Montana. I think this Joe Navarro, I think the same guy has done something else that I've read or seen or watched. I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted if I find it. Yeah. So, so the book that I recommend is The Ellipsis Manual. Oh. <gasps> <laughs> it's analysis and engineering of human behavior and it's by chase hughes and so it was ori originally written as a manual for intelligence intelligence fields operation and yeah it, it does a lot of body language as well and how to read people but it yeah it really teaches you how to kind of see through the mass so very kind of similar to yours but he also really teaches you how to covertly influence people and like hijack Ooh. their thoughts and feelings and plant ideas and like develop rapport. I, yeah, I remember I was reading this book when I was writing the hypnotherapy course that yeah. Daryl and I both teach. And remember, I called you up <laughs> and I <Yeah>. said, <laughs> Daryl. Instead of teaching NLP, I think we should teach what's in this manual. And you're like, oh, well, I, you know, people kind of want to learn NLP, which is <laughs> linguistic programming. It's kind of what they signed up for. But there's this one bit in the book where he talks about how the CIA used to split 
people's personalities. And they would create this like new alter or new personality. And this is something we work with as hypnotherapists all the time. We don't purposely do it, but we all have these different aspects to our personality. But they, yeah. he talks about a method to purposely split a personality, create a new personality that'll do what they want to do. And like the CIA used to use this technique with, you know, and they, like the Manchurian candidate or, you know, they'd have people and they'd have to activate them, right? And I got to say, I, I mean, me and Caroline were talking about this and I was like, bullshit. <laughs> uh, I know hypnotherapy. I teach hypnotherapy. I know the mind. And I'm like, no fucking way you can do that. The mind protects you, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I was like, yes, it can. So Caroline Don't. sends me this excerpt from the ellipsis manual and I read it. I'm like, oh my fucking God, Caroline, this would work. This yeah. would do it. Like if you did this process on someone that was suggestible, they would create a new personality that you would control. It's crazy. Like I was like, oh, we should do it. We should show this to the end. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> do not let people see this. Do not give this information out. The general public should not know how to do this. I mean, to be fair, if you're listening to this, unless you're a super awesome hypnotherapist, you're probably, even if you read that script, you wouldn't be able to do it. It's, mm. It takes a bit of skill and lots more than just a script to actually make this work. But I'm, I know if you did that or I did that, that would work. Yeah. I think if someone tried to do it to me, it would not work. Because I know, yeah, I think, I think it depends on the person. I think that you, you couldn't just do it to anyone. Basically, what they do in the script, should I say what they do? You could give an outline without giving, like, the exact detail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they do something to cause trauma. And yeah, so they, they hypnotize them and they have them imagine that they're in a hallway and there's all these doors in the hallway and the water and water comes in and it starts filling up and it's filling up and it's filling up and you're getting to the point where you're floating to the top of the ceiling and you're like, <gasps> you know, and it's like they take them through this process of almost drowning them. And then the water recedes and they do it over and over. And then they have the door open. Finally, when this person's like felt like they're going to die 10 times, they, they open the door and someone comes and like saves them. I've probably given way too much fucking detail now. <laughs> it's not <laughs> enough really to replicate it. <laughs> yeah. Like you got to be fucking good to be able to do this. But yeah. And that person comes and saves them. That person who comes and saves them is then the new altar who's going to protect them. And yeah, and it's so, I mean, because split personalities develops from trauma, right? Yeah. And the altar is controlled by the speaker. So whoever's taking them through the process, the speaker tells the altar to let you in. So the, alt, so the speaker is con in control of this altar and the altar is going to do whatever the speaker says. So, but the thing is you need to be a very, in order for this to actually work on somebody, right? You would need to be a very compliant personality type. Yes. You would need to really respect authority and do whatever they tell you. Wouldn't work for us. <laughs> yeah. Like it wouldn't, that's why I'm saying it wouldn't, 95% of the population, this technique would not work on, but. <laughs> it doesn't they, need to work on 95%. It needs to work on one person. Yeah. To get so the they, job done. Yeah. Yeah. They pick very specific people to do stuff like this. Hopefully the CIA isn't pulling shit like this again anymore. I would hope so, but I'm sure about they are. It. No. Yeah. It's funny. My grandfather was in the military. He was a colonel in the military and he was also a doctor. And mm. he definitely was involved in some fucking dodgy shit. <laughs> like he. <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. And he wouldn't really talk. He wouldn't ever talk about it. I definitely, I found a box full of photographs in his dark room. He used to, you know, he did a lot of photography as well that just, yeah, I don't know. I wonder what happened to them because it was pretty fucking weird, but you could tell it was like basically photographs of them running some type of experiment, Gee. but they must've been destroyed. I found these when I was like nine. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah, moving on. Military. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's let's not, let's not be a clipe, Caroline. <laughs> I know. Maybe I should cut that bit out. Let's I, sink I, ships. Yeah, I don't know, but you know, it's funny. He used to always tell me I should go into the military, and they really could use someone like me. And I was like, I'm just way too non-compliant to ever be told what to do like that. But then when I started 
studying hypnotherapy, he was very supportive, which I was like completely fucking shocked by. And so was my grandmother. And then he was like, well, maybe, you know, you can come back to America and, you know, we, I could, you know, help you get some connections. We really could use people like you, you know, I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah, it's just, wow. uh, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. So, and then I had a uh, great uncle who was in the CIA. No one knew he was in the CIA until he died, <laughs> basically. He, he said he was, I can't remember what he said, but he was definitely like a JP, like people would come to the house and he would marry them. But he said he like worked for the government, but for some like really kind of inane office salesy, like, you know, contracts or something like that. But then when he died, it's like his kids were like, actually, no, he was fucking CIA and involved in a lot of scary shit. So it's just interesting. You know, it's similar tools that we use, like in, in therapy with hypnotherapy and neuro-linguistic programming to what they use in the CIA. It's about getting information, but of course it's the frame of it, isn't it? Like Caroline and I, we're using it to help people, like to find out what it is we need to know to help someone stop smoking or lose weight or, or lose their phobia. But what I learned, a friend of mine was a fraud investigator for a big mm. corporate and used to go overseas and, and investigate really large scale fraud. And all their training was from the CIA training. So it was yeah. the same people that trained the CIA would come to to where he lived and, and train him. And what I realized is he was doing NLP and hypnotherapy. Like it was mm. all NLP and hypnotherapy, this whole process. I watched him teach a class on online one time. And I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly how I teach my class. <laughs> it was the yes. same things, but completely different context. Here's the thing. When it comes to hypnosis and working with a hypnotherapist, you want to be very, very careful about who you allow in your brain. Yeah. Like, don't just let some dude that you're dating. No, definitely not. <laughs> no, don't let some dude you're dating <laughs> do it. Don't let some friend of a friend do it. I would be very careful even letting people practice on you. Yeah, I think that if you want to have some hypnotherapy done, research hypnotherapists, make sure that they are accredited, that they have gone to a good school, that they have done more than just like a four-day class and call themselves a master hypnotherapist because don't even fucking get me started on that topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll run into other, oh, I'm having a therapist too. I do like a weekend course. And I'm like, oh, shut up, bitch. I should study for years to do what I do. You know, it's not a weekend course. So you need to be so careful about who you allow in your brain. You want to really trust them. Don't ever let anyone who wants to fuck you hypnotize you, right? Like, yeah. That's and good I think, advice. Yeah. And Just tell in general your, for life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless you're really compliant. And if, and if you trust the person and you want them to hypnotize you, tell yourself before you do this, that if they say anything that you don't agree with, that you will instantly snap out of it, that you will be wide awake and that you will not comply with that. And I'd be very clear to say that to them. And that's, I mean, that's normally how it works. If someone says something to you that you don't agree with, you're going to absolutely like dismiss that information, not go along with it. Yeah. It's not going to work. Like I had one client. I mean, I always do my spiel with people that, you know, you can't be hypnotized against your will. If someone, you know, if I were to say anything dodgy, it's, you know, you would be instantly awake and, and be like, forget this, I'm out of here. So I said this to one woman and she was like, yeah, I know. I went to this doctor who like, I had a son who had ADHD. And so I go to this doctor and he starts telling me that I need sessions. He says to her, you need some sessions with me. You know, part of this is you need to stay calm and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he was like an accredited doctor that had like, I think he might've even been a psychiatrist. I need to help you with your hysteria by fixing your wondering womb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A little bit of pelvic massage. And so he's doing the session and blah, blah, blah. And she's all fine. And then he says to her, and whenever I say the words, walk the dog, you will get incredibly turned on. You'll become incredibly horny. And she's like, I just went cold. I had like chills and I went, oh, fuck, I need to get the fuck out of here. Right. And so she, but she was like, I just froze, pretended like I didn't say, you know, didn't hear it. And that you'll just be compelled to want to have sex with me and you'll send a message and you'll be very open for us sleeping together and blah, blah, blah. And she was like, she just was, she said, what? I have never, yeah, never been so wide awake in my entire life. And she said, so she, like he finishes and he puts that suggestion in several times. 
And then, and then he says, and you will forget I ever said this to you and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, does all that. And she's like, fuck, no, I'm not going to forget that. So he comes up and he was like, oh, how was that? And she was like, yeah, great. And he was like, so you, do you have a dog? You're going to walk your dog today? And she was like, fuck you. And she fucking walked out. She didn't pay. Then the, the receptionist like uh-huh. ran after her and she was like, fuck you. That guy just tried to hypnotize me to have sex with him. And she said she like yelled at the receptionist. And the receptionist was like, oh my God. And so she went directly to the police and she reported Good. it. Good. Good. Yeah. And they investigated him. They started contacting other patients. And he had done this to several patients. And, like, no one else had reported him. Who knows if he actually was successful. But um, they ended up – the guy went to jail for years and um, lost his medical license and all kinds of stuff. But, yeah, interesting. This was a GP in New Zealand. This was a psychiatrist Psychiatrist. in Auckland. In Auckland City, like, in the, you know – downtown very fancy offices wow. well respected yeah I'll, i should google the story but yeah she was just like i know that i would have never done it <laughs> you know, i was like good on you girl she's like but i will never be hypnotized by a man again i'll tell you right no. now so yeah be careful with it what and if you think someone's trying to do something dodgy to you they probably are and just yeah <laughs> walk away or go oh well that's cute does that actually work on people <laughs> No, I, I, I think you're right. You can get a vibe off of someone who's creepy. I, I tend to think that most women will feel more comfortable with other women hypnotizing them. Mm. And from my point of view, most women are feel really comfortable when they find out I'm a gay man. So yeah. I, I have a photo of me and my dad um, up on the wall and everyone goes, oh, is that your partner? I was like, no, that was my dad. But they it opens the conversation to them knowing that I'm gay and they often tell me that they're relieved. Like they, well, that's one of the reasons they came to see me because they can feel safe because totally. there is, there are dodgy guys out there. And just because I'm gay or straight doesn't mean that you're dodgy or not dodgy, but um, it, it's just a feeling of safety. Women, straight women tend to feel more safe with a gay man than a straight yeah. man sometimes. <laughs> totally. That's what I, cause uh, like I've definitely, I've had students that are gay and I'm like, lead with that. Yeah. <laughs> Any woman lead with the fact that you're gay. It, it will trust me. It'll, it'll help with the rapport and it'll help them feel safer when you hypnotize them. Because if they don't like it, you don't want to see them anyway. Right. So yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. And, and it's New Zealand. So yeah. So, um, mm. yeah, be careful. <laughs> and but just, just because one person had a bad experience, I, I want to show you there are so many amazing hypnotherapists. I, I've, I've trained, oh, I don't know, into the hundreds of of hypnotherapists now, clinical hypnotherapists, and like ninety nine percent of them are just really amazing, beautiful, loving people who want to help. Exactly. And no matter what profession you're in, you're gonna get a dodgy cunt somewhere. Mm. So, so listen to your gut. If something in you goes, mm, nah, it's like don't even go there. Then you know what I mean. If it's like any, yeah, I think it's so important to listen to your intuition because it's it's very smart and it tells you a lot. Mm, well, that was a very interesting chat as usual, Daryl. Yeah, it was great to to hang out again. We'll be able to meet in person soon. I know. We actually technically could now, but it's just, yeah, with traffic and all that. Yeah, I had the kiddies till just before I came online, my sister's kids mm. to look after. So, But yeah, maybe next time we'll be in the same room, but it's been great hanging out Caroline online mm. virtually over the last couple of months and, yeah. and joining you for these. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy our podcast, please rate or review or like tell your friends because the more people we can help, the better. Yeah. And if you have a question <laughs> or a story or anything that you want to tell us, feel free because we love to read your stories. And it's just, it's so interesting to hear what's going on in people's lives. And yeah, we just really appreciate you, the listener. And yeah. It's amazing. So your stories are amazing. Listen to what we had today. Brilliant stories. Keep sending them, please. Thank you. And we need other people's stories so we can like share other people's point of view and get wisdom from each other and other, you know, stories are the most important thing. I would like to know if anybody has a good dogging story. Oh, so Jesus. if you've got a good dogging <laughs> story, send that in because that's the topic that's coming up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Next time, dogging. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we'll see yeah. you soon. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.